Hello, Beak Squad. David Burns, good to be with you today. And I'm so glad that so many of you have joined us here on the live stream tonight. Good to be with all of you. And I hope you had a good Thanksgiving. We uh, we did, and we did not have a live stream last week. So it's good to be back this week to share a lot of bee stuff with you tonight. So hope you're having uh, a great evening. And wow, December, I think the first day of December is tomorrow, isn't it? So, and man, Christmas is coming so fast. So leave a comment where you're uh, from tonight, from where in the world that you live right now and watching it. And so we appreciate all of you guys being here from different places. All great beekeepers coming together to talk everything bee related tonight. And uh, good times when we talk about bees. And I hope you've enjoyed my videos that I've made all this week. I've been pumping the videos out about, especially about what to look for when you're doing your hive inspections, what kind of things to uh, find on the frames, how to identify things. We even had a pretty rough one, pretty nasty one, where I showed American fowl brood and I showed a lot of bad stuff you can see on frames. And uh, that's good to know because, you know, you want to keep your bees healthy and get ahead of anything bad happening. So if you haven't seen those videos this week, be sure and check those videos out. I'll keep making a bunch more on different diseases. And uh, so it'll be real informative. I've got people here tonight from Texas, Tennessee, Indiana, Ohio, and of course, uh, Illinois. Look at that. Virginia, Florida, Arkansas. I was born in Arkansas. Virginia, Kansas, Ohio, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, uh, East Tennessee. Uh, Tennessee is so uh, long, you have to distinguish whether you're from East Tennessee or West Tennessee. <laughs> And uh, wow, look at that. People from all over. So thanks for joining us tonight. Good to see you guys. Wisconsin. Yeah, Missouri. Utah. Yep. Good to see Utah. Washington, Fox, Fox Island, Washington. Look at that. Iowa, New York, Michigan. Mm -hmm. Kentucky, Colorado. Very good. Oh, yeah. Going to be buying my first hive kit this winter. Going to be taking one of your classes. That's good to, good to hear that. That's going to be uh, a good thing to do in the wintertime. Take a beekeeping class. Get all up to date on all the new stuff so you can start beekeeping with a lot of knowledge. That's right. We got New York and Iowa. Look at that. Florida. That's great. All right. New York again. New Hampshire. All right. Alabama. Yep. Mm, Minnesota. Hi from Sweden. I think that's the farthest one away. That could be Sweden, Illinois. <laughs> I doubt it. <laughs> All right. I don't know what time it is in Sweden, but I know it's not the same as mine. And uh, Ohio. Look at that. That's uh, Love, Ohio. That's where I started keeping bees. And then South Africa. Oh, very good. I've been to Africa. I don't think I've been to South Africa. Yeah. Well, good to have all of you guys. Is that a Canadian flag I think I see there? That's great. Awesome. Well, thank you for sharing where you're from. Uh, I'm uh, buckered down here in Illinois. Kind of rainy night tonight. Been kind of a, a weird uh, weather pattern we've been having. We've had some extremely couple of days of really cold weather where it got down to um, oh, I don't know, 15 degrees and a chill factor on top of that. So very, very cold. Warmed up the last couple of days, getting a little bit of rain tonight. So um, fun times. Yeah. I wonder what kind of beekeeping stuff you guys have been doing. Uh, look at this. I want to show you guys this tonight. Uh, Candy and Robbie, who take care of all of our Bee Squad merchandise, is now introduced this new product that we can drink from. Look at that. And it comes with a, a nice metal straw. That's pretty cool and a nice lid that opens and closes. We're, we're going to give one of these away right now, and then we're going to give another one away toward uh, the end of our live stream tonight. So look at that. That is a pretty, pretty, pretty tumbler is what it's called. It's called tumbler, and that's going to be our key word tonight. So if you'll take a moment now and just put the word tum uh, hashtag tumbler, uh, put that hashtag tumbler in the comment section, and that way we can start uh, collecting comments. So hashtag Tumblr, look at that. That's the word to use, and you could win a Tumblr tonight. Uh, we'll, we'll give two of these away, one right now, and then one toward the end of the broadcast. So if you're just tuning in, giving away a free Tumblr with, with Beak Squad on it, 
I, I love that image. Look at that. Got some little stickers and things that you can put on your computers or windows and such. So uh, leave a com comment, hashtag Tumblr. We'll see who will win one of these. Um, I'm gearing up for the North American Bee Honey Bee Expo coming up. Boy, it won't be long now. January the 4th and the through the 6th in Louisville, Kentucky. Many of you are going to be there. And I'm hoping that you'll take advantage of some T-shirt offerings we have where you can wear your T-shirt to the Beak Squad a Beak Squad shirt to the conference. Get a big picture of us all together, and maybe you'll bring your tumbler that you win tonight. So uh, that'd be great. Well, we've got 102 of you, 106 of you that have already uh, gone ahead and put in hashtag tumbler to win this nice. It's like a real, you know, I tried one of these the other day, and I, I thought maybe it would be, I don't know if I had coffee in it or something cold, but it is well insulated. I really liked it. And uh, might have been this one, actually. But we'll send you a new one, one that I haven't already drank from. <laughs> All right, wrap it up. Hashtag Tumblr so that I can spin the wheel and we'll draw and see who wins. Are you ready? Get your last little hashtag Tumblr in the comments section right now. By the way, if you enter your name more than once, won't help you any. Waste of time. Don't do that. And if you're watching this, the replay, if you're not watching this live, and some people say, how do I know if it's live or not? <laughs> well, if you're not watching this live, then there's no reason to try to enter into the drawing. It's over if you're not watching it live, if you're watching the replay. Okay. All right. So let's draw. Ready? One, two, three. We're drawing a name. Look at that. All right. Here we go. Who's going to be our winner? Oh, Bobby Perkins has won a Beak Squad Tumblr. Way to go, Bobby. Good job. If you will email longlanehoneybees at gmail.com, that'll help uh, Sherry get that information of where to send this to from you as the winner. That email is not monitored. So those of you that may want to try to write to that, it's only used to uh, secure the name of the winners. So just, uh, just the winner only, please. All right, good. Good time. Good time uh, participating in that. And if you guys are want to stick around, we're going to give one of these away again toward the end of the broadcast as well. Um, I was going to share some things with you guys about uh, honeybees, particularly pros and cons. I was thinking today about the pros and cons of beekeeping. And uh, I think most of us that are probably watching tonight have already dealt with the pros and cons of beekeeping. Like we don't really care uh, that there are cons because we love bees that much that we're just, you know, we can find a way not to really care about the negative side of beekeeping, right? We just love bees that much. We want to talk bees. We want to be on live streams. We want to hear me, more people talk about bees. But, and I'll talk more about bees in just a minute, but I kind of jotted some notes down. I want to let you guys know about um, pros and cons. I've got uh, three cons and a bunch of pros, obviously. Um, is that right? Maybe we're going backwards. Oh yeah, let's do let's do the uh, let's do the pros first. Okay, yeah, I want to talk about the bad stuff first. Let's talk about the good stuff first. Well, obviously, the best part of beekeeping is it is one of the most enjoyable hobbies that you can have. No kidding, it really is fun. Whether it's a hobby or a sideline business for you, maybe you're a commercial beekeeper, uh, wherever you're at, beekeeping is a really good, enjoyable hobby. Here's why. I think it's enjoyable because it gets us outdoors. And so we're out in the, you know, out in the field or the yard. We're out on nice sunny days or spring days playing with our bees. So it gets us moving, being outside, fresh air, really good for us. And also it's such an enjoyable hobby because it's good for our mental health. I made a video today, if you haven't watched it, about how important beekeeping is to strengthen us physically and mentally. I really think it does. So um, think about all the times that you have uh, had to really use your physique and your mind in beekeeping. You know, lifting heavy boxes, you're kind of building your strength in your core, your back, your arms, your legs. And then I think it's really harder in uh, mental. Uh, we're using our brains and our minds all the time, aren't we, in beekeeping? So rather than sitting in a rocking chair, uh, doing a crossword puzzle, 
we're out there using our minds and breathing fresh air, doing some exercise, moving and walking through our bee yard. So it is an enjoyable hobby. Um, also, it's also have an effect on expanding pollinators in our area. Our bees are going around the block, going around the countryside, pollinating other people's uh, gardens, fruit trees, vegetables. So our bees that we have are helping other people out who are raising gardens and needing their crops or fields pollinated. So we are, we are blessed to have the, uh, the, I guess the privilege to raise and care for these pollinators that are having such an impact on everybody within a three or four mile radius of us. So that's enjoyable to know that we're helping that with flowers and everything. And then uh, also thought about enjoying that wonderful taste of honey. Are you addicted to honey like I am? Gosh, it tastes good, doesn't it? Have you noticed that some honey is sweeter than other honey? Um, boy, I've noticed um, when I when I really enjoy honey that sometimes it's like, this honey is not as sweet as the other honey that I had the other day. But I'll tell you, a friend of mine asked me the other day, is honey um, from different places, does it have a sweeter flavor than other honeys do? And of course it does. Nectar just comes from different flowers and some nectar is much sweeter. And I'll tell you the honey that I get from around here, from my hives, it is so sweet. Some of you send me honey, thank you, and I try it and my honey still has your honey beet. My honey is still sweet. Man, I think mine's mostly clover, but it is sweet. So that's that's another pro of being a beekeeper. We have this um, free pass to eat all the honey that we want to <laughs> and not gain, gain any weight, right? We put it in our coffee. We I love it on toast. Oh my gosh. Put some butter on a piece of toast and some honey. Oh, wow. That's so good, isn't it? Um, and if we all confess, we have to admit, we all sneak over there once in a while and just get a big teaspoon of honey all by itself. <laughs> and we enjoy that honey. It would just eat it by itself sometimes. So the, the honey is certainly one of the benefits of being a beekeeper. Um, let's see. Um, by beekeeping bees, we're ensuring that honeybees have a good future. So all of us uh, caring for bees, you know, we're trying to help bees be healthy, reproduce, make more colonies. So we're ensuring that bees are going to be around for a while. So we can pat ourselves on the back for that one, for helping bees out. Um, you know, we, we sell nucleuses and packages and so many other beekeepers do too, raising queens, helping people that need queens. So our part in producing bees are maintaining and caring for bees are really helping our ecosystem stay strong as uh, we need our bees. All right, one more, one more pro, and then we'll get into some cons, but one more pro is uh, mentoring other beekeepers and making friends. I mean, look at tonight. We've got Sherry helping us. We got Jessica helping us tonight on the live stream. And we got all of you wonderful Beak Squad people here that are leaving comments, chatting to each other in the comments, listening to me, sharing thoughts together, winning tumblers, getting excited about stuff. And so, you know, uh, that's another big pro in beekeeping is the friendships that we develop and the um, camaraderie that we have, the co collaborations that we have. I work with a lot of beekeepers um, and beekeeping manufacturers and people that produce beekeeping equipment. And so I read a lot of uh, research that beekeeper scientists are always performing. And so it's a big community and I like how we're getting along. Beekeepers used to not get along really well. They didn't. I don't think they did. When I started back in the early 90s, um, I didn't see this level of friendships. Um, I, it was more competitive, a little bit nasty at times. Um, and now it's uh, getting a lot better. And uh, the whole atmosphere of beekeeping has changed tremendously. When I started beekeeping, I didn't see near as many uh, younger people or uh, women in, in beekeeping, and now I do. So I love seeing that, such a variety of people getting into beekeeping of all walks of life. So that's really good. It's it's really a great, uh, a great fellowship, a great friendly time for all of us to be together. All right, what are some of the cons and challenges? Maybe challenges is a better word. What are some of the challenges of beekeeping? You know, right off the bat, let's be honest. It is expensive 
starting beekeeping. Now, I know some of you may say, no, it's not. If you put a swarm trap out and if you build your own equipment and all that, you can save a bunch of money. That's so true. But that's usually not what most people are doing. Most people getting into beekeeping today are buying all the equipment from beekeeping stores, having it shipped to you. Shipping sometimes is free, but if it's not, shipping is expensive. And then you have to buy your bees or your nuke. And bees and nukes are expensive as well. 150 bucks, sometimes 200, 250 bucks for a nucleus. So uh, it's easy to spend anywhere from a whopping four, five hundred, a thousand dollars or more. If you go with something like a pro, uh, like a flow hive, uh, those are going to run up, you know, run the tab up pretty quick. And then you got to buy your bee suit your hive tool, and let's face it, if you get a beekeeping catalog from one of the major beekeeping companies, isn't there a lot of gadgets that you can buy in there? Oh my gosh. <laughs> and you start looking at it and you think, man, I need this, I need that, I need that. And before long, it can really be expensive. And so um, that's one of the negative sides of beekeeping. But on the other hand, I've heard people say this, I'm not, I've, I've golfed a little bit, but not, not enough to own a set of golf clubs, <laughs> but I've heard people say golfing is really expensive. I've heard people say uh, things like fishing. If you buy your own bass boat and uh, depth finders and all of that, that can, you know, yeah, you can, you can get a lot of money wrapped up in any kind of hobby that you choose to do. Right. And so beekeeping is no exception. Um, what about keeping another con is keeping your hives uh, healthy. That requires a lot of work. I mean, it really does. I joke a lot with my friend, John, who's a Vishlock. We talk about this a lot, is that when we teach a beginner's class, we always start off by saying, beekeeping is great. It's fun. It's a great hobby. It's good exercise. Be outside in the fresh air. You know, and then we get into the equipment and you have to buy this equipment, buy that equipment. The last thing we ever talk about are the bad things, the challenges that you have to deal with. And one of them is keeping the hive alive because, you know, look, a lot of you are facing winter right now. I saw some in the comment sections. You're from cold areas right now. So your bees are really going through stress from cold weather, but just in the spring and summer doing our inspections, keeping our hives healthy from not having too many viral destructor mites or small hive beetles uh, keeping them expanding in the right way, making sure they don't have American foul brood, European foul brood, sac brood, chalk brood, so many diseases. You could become a hypochondriac pretty soon worrying about everything in the hive is going to take out your hive. So I, I know because I mentor a lot of people uh, in beekeeping and I hear a, a lot of you say how worried you are about your bees. So that's kind of a con, a negative, a challenge, keeping your bees healthy. And the third thing is quitting is really easy to do. <laughs> I mean, when you quit beekeeping, you don't have to sign anything. You don't have to pay off anything. You just quit. And it's so easy to quit. And a lot of new beekeepers quit usually their first year if they don't make it through winter. They're done. You know, because they feel like they failed. They can't do it. They don't want to put another group of bees through what happened last year. So quitting is easy and that's too bad uh, because I want to always encourage people to keep trying it because sometimes you really don't get a good handle on beekeeping until your fourth or fifth year. And so if you can just hang in there long enough and keep at it, you'll have a breakthrough when you start to identify things a little bit better, what's going on in your hive. So, so don't quit. That's kind of a con. It's easy to quit. And uh, the last thing is, Beekeeping can be a very lonely hobby. You know, if your hobby is bowling, there's bowling night with all your friends and you can eat cheeseburgers and fries and have a beer together <laughs> and talk and laugh and all that stuff. You know, beekeeping can be lonely. It's, I mean, I know you have bee clubs and you can go to different clubs, open up a hive sometimes, but that's once a month. So the rest of the time, it's pretty lonely because you're out there by yourself in a beehive. And uh, so it can be a lonely hobby, unlike some hobbies where you're golfing with your buddies and, you know, you're doing other things with a bunch of friends. It can be um, kind of uh, lonely. So you have to make sure that you don't make yourself a hermit and just stay tucked away in your backyard looking in your hives. You need a little bit of social life. So 
be sure and participate in live streams or go to bee clubs at, or go to the North American Honeybee Expo. And that's where you can really hang out with a lot of people at one time. Um, I wanted to share one more thing with you and then we'll have a, a time to take some questions. I know a lot of you may have different questions about beekeeping going to ask me. I'll be happy to answer those tonight, but let me share one more thing as you think about your questions. Um, a while back, a few years ago, I was doing some studies and experimenting with raising sugar water um, to be the kind of the similar to what uh, bees would have in when they consume honey. And so I experimented with adding vitamin C, ascorbic acid uh, to sugar water to try to get the pH balance similar to that of honey. And just for fun, I thought I, I have a pH, a P, I have a PhD degree. I don't have a PhD. I have a pH meter. <laughs> and so that pH meter, I used, I used it to measure a lot of pH balance numbers on a lot of different things. And uh, see if you know what some of these, I'll use honey. I'll have honey. It's the last thing. Let me be sure. Oh, there's honey there. Okay. I'm looking at my screen. So coffee, if you're a coffee drinker, if you're going to put coffee in your Beak Squad tumbler, Bobby, if you if, if you uh, email us, um, the pH number in coffee is 5.66, 5.66. So that's interesting. And a pH, by the way, stands for power of hydrogen. And so when, when you write the small p and then you write um, the capital H because it's an element. But um, to give you an idea, water is you know, what we think of really uh, alkaline, that has a pH of seven, okay? So coffee is 5.6. So the lower the number, the more acidic it is, okay? And the more acidy it is. Coffee, you know, has the coffee acid to it. How about ginger ale? I, pu I pulled out a bottle, of, a bottle of ginger ale and I, I tested it out. It's really acidic, 3.32. Wow, that's that's pretty acidic. More than coffee. I'm not going to tell you what honey is. All right. So here's milk. Um, my children say that I say the word milk funny. And I can't hear me. I can't hear myself say it funny. But if you want to laugh at me for saying it funny, <laughs> I say milk. Okay. So milk is, I, I always think of milk as more of an alkaline, you know, but it's 6.62. So it does have a higher pH number, which means it's not as acidic. Okay. We know, we all knew that. All right. Let's see. Orange juice. Ooh, what would orange juice be? It's acidic too. If you have acid, what's it called? Acid reflux or something like that. <laughs> Is that the right word? Um, orange juice comes in pretty, a lot of acid. Three, three, three point six four. Wow. And then I tried distilled vinegar. By the way, if you have some mold somewhere on wood or something, vinegar is the thing to go to. You don't want to use bleach except on porcelain, but you can use vinegar to kill mold on, on wood and things like that. Be something you'd use in your hive even if you had a top cover that kind of got some mold on it, mildew in the going through winter in the spring. You could take it off and get some vinegar and put on there to kill any mold spores, by the way. So distilled vinegar comes in Listen, it wins 2.26. Wow, that's really strong. And it a lot that's that's a lot of acid. All right. So uh oh, I, I gotta tell you what water is. Okay, water, water, alkaline, seven. It takes the takes a winning number, 7.20. And then here comes honey. Now, do you think honey is gonna be acidic or not? Those of you that know honey, you know it's acidic. Sometimes if you if you eat certain honey, it hits the back of your throat, can actually kind of burn the back of your throat a little bit. It has a pH balance of pH uh, number of 3.52. That's crazy, isn't it? Wow. <laughs> okay. I thought that'd be just fun to kind of think about all those pHs and how they how it pans out in different uh, different things that we eat and how it relates to honey. All right. Uh, let's see what time it is. And uh, yep, trying to make it to about 725 tonight before we start taking questions. And uh, let's just uh, go ahead and feel free to 
ask any questions you want to tonight. That's what we're here for. For Q&A, you can share your questions and we'll get some answered. Uh, in the meantime, while you're putting your questions in the comment, um, I'll just say right now, man, we've we've really been, uh, I, I've been behind on getting my hives ready for winter. I've got my horizontal hive. I've got to go out there today or tomorrow and measure it and uh, start insulating the top of it. I got to figure out how to do that on the inside. And I've got to specially make some of my winter be kinds to fit inside of that horizontal hive. So that's going to be something that I've got to do before it really gets cold, but it's war still warming up a little bit, still gradually getting a little bit nicer. Hey, Mark, how are you? Nice to see you, Mark. Have you had more success overwintering in poly hives versus woodenware? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm holding my thumb up. And I think my when I do something like this, <laughs> my screen gives a thumbs up. And if I accidentally do this, <laughs> My screen will go thumbs down. So I didn't I didn't mean to give you a thumbs down. <laughs> okay. So uh poly hives. Uh I've used poly hives, I think, one time, and I didn't see, I mean, one hive I used a long time ago was a poly hive. Didn't really see any difference other than I think I melted the lid when I put my smoker on it or something. But no, that was one of those polystyrene hives melted the lid a little bit, but um, I do have more of them in the field this year. I've got several plastic hives and I'm, I'm thinking they're going to overwinter better, but like I always say, it doesn't matter so much the hive. If you have other issues like low numbers of bees, you have high viral counts from the varroa destructor mites. They weren't controlled in the whole year long. So there's so many other factors that can take your bees out. Winter survival, in my opinion, just me, what do I know, right? In my opinion and experience of almost 30 years of beekeeping, what really matters is how healthy your bees are. Not really too, I'm not really too much of a guy that's going to try to have the best hive and they'll do better in those kind of hives. So you got to really do good. Okay, Mark, how are you? Uh, question in Omaha, weather like yours, when we have a week of high temperatures, of 50 for a week. Can I feed one-to-one -one sugar water that week? Give it a try. Here's the thing, Mark. I want your bees to be able to fly. Um, sometimes when they consume liquid sugar, they may want to defecate more frequently. And so that's probably a good idea if you're running it like that. Um, make sure they're flying. So anytime your bees, it's warm enough and your bees are flying, they can take cleansing flights. Yeah, give it a try. They may not eat as much when it's cool like that. Jay Evans, I have a Layens hive. I, you know, I want a Layens hive. I really do. I think they're really cool. I like the the frame sizes are a little different. I'm using Langstroth hives in my horizontal hive, so Layens hives are similar but different. Have you thought about candy boards for them? Well, yeah, I have. I, what I need to do is just buy a Layens hive, um, and and start running it, and then I can have um, have winter bee kinds made to fit them. So that's what I want to do with my horizontal hives too. Good question. Um, yeah, I think that's a good one. Sometimes it's tough to to make these winter bee kinds fit some of the different hives people have uh, kind of created here lately, and you might have to retrofit them yourself. I'm hoping that I can take an eight frame winter bee kind and make it fit into my horizontal hive perfectly without having to alter it. But I'm, I'm going to go down there and measure it. I think tomorrow, see see what it looks like. Hey, Rodney, how are you? Are citrus acid and apples cider vinegar beneficial for winter patties, feeding bees through the winter? That's a very good question. I've read a lot of literature over the years that talks about um, citrus acid or apple cider, cider vinegar being, you know, fed to bees and all. And I don't know the outcome of that. I've not really done it myself. Um, so I'm not the one to recommend or not recommend that really don't know. Um, but if you think you can find good literature, uh, scientific, maybe studies that have been done, uh, then, um, certainly you could tinker with that and see how your bees do. Anytime you do this, by the way, Rodney, and all of you listening, anytime you want to experiment with your bees, let's say you have five hives and you want to test something out. How many hives do you test it on? <laughs> yeah, just test it on one. Don't do all five. If it, if it doesn't work out, then you, you've just kind of ruined five hives. So uh, that's sometimes why a five-frame nucleus is good to have. 
You can do a little test on your five frame nucleus. Hello there, Tracy. How are you? What would be your opinion, the best style of top cover and why? Um, yeah, okay. When when I bought out a commercial beekeeper many, many moons ago, many years ago, I actually, uh, I actually, they were all, uh, they were from the South, so they all had uh, migratory lids on them. And I don't uh, mind migratory lids. I know a lot of commercial beekeepers use migratory lids because they're bees. Migratory beekeepers often keep them in the South, but um, they are so you can palatize, palatize can't say that word, put bees on a pallet. And uh, so if you have the migratory lids, you can migrate across the country with them, then easier than a top cover. There's other benefits to a migratory lid. That's Migratory lid is simply just a board, usually a couple of boards, and uh, they don't telescope, telescope. They don't telescope over the edges. They lay flat. You may have on a migratory lid, the front and back may actually hang over a little bit. So I don't mind those. I've used them before, but some of mine kind of are warped. And if I don't, if I'm not careful, water can get in there. Snow can get in there. Robbers can get in there. So not a big fan of where I live in my environment for using migratory lids. I like telescoping lids. Now, most bee companies sell the wooden telescoping lids with metal on them, some kind of a tin or aluminum. It hangs over the hive an inch or two or three and um, has a little play in it. Those work really well. Keeps the weather out. That's what you're trying to do. And now there's all kind of plastic top covers. Last year in my videos, you saw me use a lot of plastic top covers, and I was afraid they were going to blow off. But I was surprised my beads glued them right down. And they have enough little ventilation built into it, too, that it did, it did, it allowed upper ventilation without me having to put a quarter under the box or something under the lid. So I kind of like the plastic ones, the um, Be Smart plastic top covers. They're lightweight. They don't, and I have a lot of top covers that get kind of, um, well, if you keep bees long enough, your equipment starts to fail. And so wooden top covers and bottom boards are the first really to kind of see that. They get a lot of moisture in there on the under, underside. So um, I like plastic top covers. They, they work really well. If you can find an insulated top cover, uh, I think that's even better probably. So hope that answers your question. That's kind of my personal opinion about uh, top covers for you. Yeah, a lot of different choices. The killer bees. Wow, <laughs> what a picture. <laughs> Should I put fondant on top or below the honey super that I'm leaving on for the winter? I think most of us feel like it uh, needs to go on top of that honey super kind of want it on top there when the bees get up in there they'll have that option um i'm not sure what kind of negative it, a negative effect it would have if you put it between your honey super and the brood area um i think it might work the same probably um i think i've done that early on before i came up with the winter be kind i think i tried those kind of experiments um the only problem with putting it in between boxes is it's kind of you almost have to make a shim or a spacer to allow it to be placed there, but you might do that anyway on top. But um, I think most of us feel like it needs to be where the bees are going to find it at the very top, top feeder like scenario. Good question. I'd go for the top. Yep. Hey, Chuck, how are you? Have you had any success with a top bar hive? I think I've seen one of your old videos where you had one. I actually did run uh, several top bar hives. Um, Back then, I did not have as much knowledge of overwintering hives as I do now. So I was never successful at overwintering a top bar hive. The first year I left it on its stand. And remember, I live out on the prairie. It gets 20 below zero chill factor here. So boy, it's just rough. I didn't insulate it or anything. And I didn't know enough about feeding bees probably like I do now. So didn't have much luck overwintering it. The next one, I think I dropped it to the ground during the winter and covered it with some shipping blankets and all that. Tried all that. Didn't have any luck overwintering it. So I don't know. I, uh, I've i not been too fortunate with uh, top bar hives. Barry Van Sickle. Well, thank you so much. I see that you, um, you finished the ultimate course today. Of uh, course, uh, yeah, seven classes. Well, worth every penny. Well, thank you. You saved a penny if you got it during uh, our Black Friday sale. All right. I appreciate that. 10 out of 10 for content. Well, you're very nice. 
appreciate it. I worked hard to get those classes together. It took me many years. And of course, no one really realizes all the years that go into it prior to you making it of trying to learn and all that. Hello, EL. Good to see you here tonight. What would you do to a colony that accepted a new queen? Oh, with a colony that accepted a new queen, then killed her in two weeks, attempted to make a queen and failed. Seems have a laying worker combined to another, let them die. Yeah. You know, that's a that's a very good question. I understand. That's too bad. Sometimes um, colonies have a hard time getting queen right again. And it frustrates us as beekeepers when they do that. Um, if they if they have a laying worker, and I'm not sure where you live, it sounds like you're you live in an area where you can still go in there and work your bees. I can't do that now. Uh, combining is a sure thing, right? And especially if you've got a laying worker, that's going to help that out. Um, but on the other hand, if the if you're early spring, for example, early summer, I keep trying to give them a queen if they were well populated. I really would. Um, even with a even with a laying worker. Sometimes I can take a frame, listen to this, I can take a frame out of a queen right, well-populated hive with the queen and all her eggs on it, brood, and put it against, move it to the, the uh, laying worker hive, and I'll put it against the wall of like the top deep or the single deep with the queen facing the wall. Her pheromones and the brood pheromone will quickly clamp down laying workers in that hive, and they probably won't kill your queen. There's always a risk, but they usually, I've done it several times. They don't kill the queen in my case. So you can always try to do something like that by taking your queen away from that box that was queen right. Well, they didn't have a laying worker, so they can quickly raise a queen and replace your queen that you moved out. That's, that's a good way to handle laying workers, by the way. Hey, Sharon, how are you tonight? How soon to think about testing and treating for mites? in late winter, early spring. Wow, you know, I've been surprised uh, how many mites I can have coming out of winter because all the viral destructor mites over winter, they, I mean, there's not as much brood for them to reproduce on, but in my case, there is because I raise brood all winter on my winter bee kinds. So as soon as the temperatures hit a magic number that corresponds with the label of your treatment, uh, allow, and if it's 65 or warmer, go in there and test, take a mite test, see if you need to treat, find the treatment that'll work in your temperature zone at, in the spring, late winter, spring, and treat them. I think that's, get a head start on it for sure. So the answer is as soon as possible. Absolutely. Yep. You're going to come out of winter with mites. Oh, uh, let's see. Bushcraft with the preacher. Is there any negative considerations for using a screen bottom board during the winter as opposed to a solid bottom board? Um, you know, that's debatable. I think most people are more comfortable having a solid bottom board in the wintertime because it sounds better. I like my floor in my house during the winter. I don't want a screen floor, but to be honest with you, most of my hives have screen bottom boards on them all winter long. I don't know if I closed any off. Sometimes I do, but not very often. But again, like I teach, it uh, might be more advantageous to provide a wind block so cold air doesn't blow up in that screen. But if you're really worried about your hive, it's not going to hurt them to, to block that screen bottom board off. They have little inserts uh, that you can slide in there or make your own. Um, so if you're a little bit concerned, by all means, block it off. I think that's the way to look at it. Good question, though. Very common question. People ask me a lot about bottom boards. Yeah. Hey, hello from Germany. Hey, Henry. Bees of winter physiology. Are they physically a different bee or are they the same bee, just not as active, so they last longer? Um, yeah, they have a they have a little bit of difference in how they're made up on a molecular level. Um, but physically you couldn't tell them apart from the other bees. If we drilled down into like vitelogenin, vitelogenin stored fat bodies in the bees, that's not like our fat cells, <laughs> but bees of winter physiology can store more vitelogenin stored protein in their fat bodies. So if we drilled down and took samples of winter bees, they are different when it comes to vitelogenin, vitelogenesis, it's, it's, they're different on that level. 
but really not physically, no. So the best way I describe it is, um, and this probably isn't accurate, but it's it's it helps me explain it. But let's look at a a bee in the summertime, a, a young bee. Let's say she's uh, ten days old, so that makes her a nurse bee. She's feeding larvae. We're all jelly at that age. Um, a bee of winter physiology um, can keep doing that beyond day twelve. Uh, they can be in a pause situation, whatever their detailed duty might be, they can put themselves on pause and essentially pick it up again when there's a nectar flow for a little bit, not long, <laughs> but for a little bit. So bees of winter physiology, they're kind of like the Marines. They go in there, they're on standby for uh, a big flow and to keep the hive alive. And then they go right to work, get the job done. But I don't really think, no, there's no, you wouldn't, you couldn't really recognize the difference of how they look. Hey, Blaine, how are you doing? When do bees start laying eggs again? January. Um, that depends a lot on the, um, the type of bee, the race of bee. I hear rain and I'm so glad I'm not, I'm going to keep answering Blaine's question, but I'm glad it's raining. Yeah. Cause we need rain. <laughs> my well has been so dry people. Oh my gosh. My house. Well, it's like 30 feet deep, shallow. Well, I've had to haul water so many times. Oh my gosh. I, I hauled water today, yesterday. Mm. Okay. Back to the question. Uh, oh, so anyway, if you have, um, you know, some, some types of bees I've heard will stop laying, won't lay much like carniolans until there's a nectar flow, then they start laying really well. Uh, Italian bees lay a little bit more all winter long, so on. But I don't really think we have these strong genetic lines that we can put all our money on this one type of bee. Like I've got a 100% Italian bee. So we, most of us, if our, you know, if our colonies are requeening themselves, we just have mutts out there. They're, they're mating with drone congregation area, drones from who knows where. But anyway, I would think that all, all colonies are going to be laying a little bit of brood all winter long. Always be some brood in there. So they'll pick up, just like chickens, uh, more daylight, warmer weather, they'll start laying more. The family funny farm. Uh, please help. Uh, okay. We never heard of the wax moth and lost a hive. Can you tell us how to detour? Um, yeah, I actually have written a lot of articles on the wax moth, the greater wax moth. And uh, you see them flying around your farm, at, around the farm lights at night. And so when the conditions are right in the summer, when it's humid and such, these wax moths are looking for hives to get into. And they'll fly right into a hive, especially a weak hive. And they'll start laying eggs in there. And those eggs will then turn to lar larvae. Those larvae are, oh, I think, almost an inch, three quarters of an inch long. And they'll just run through, burrow through all your frames. They will devour your, they can make your frames disappear. The wax will disappear. And they leave black little, they defecate, they leave black droppings in your hive. Um, they also leave a lot of cocoons. And they, when, they, when the larvae kind of burrows into that wood a little bit, they leave little dense indentations in your wood. So here's the deal with wax moth. Everybody listen up really good. If you're new to the wax moth scene. All right, here you go. Ready? Wax moths are always a problem of a very weak and failing, almost failed colony. In other words, a strong colony, and I've made videos on, here on YouTube of strong colonies carrying a wax moth and a wax moth larvae a larva outside of the hive and flying away with it. Won't let it have any space. But that's the thing. They only take over weak colonies. They are the cleanup crew. They, if they were a bird, they'd be a vulture. Okay. So you see the birds uh, eating up the uh, animals that have been ran over on the roads and such. That's what wax moths are. They only come into a hive that's really weak. I know if, I know it seems like you lost it to wax moth. Because there are some bees in there. There can be some bees still there, but not enough to defend the colony. So how do you deter it? You keep strong colonies. Woo! <laughs> that's, a, that's excellent, isn't it? Just, just have to keep your hives really strong. So if you have two deep boxes for your brood area and your hive starts to get weak, think about this. 
That's too much space. If your colony is weak and you have 20 frames, please reduce it to 10 frames. That's going to help control small hive beetle, wax moths, and other things, okay? So sometimes beekeepers don't realize that, and they have two deeps, two honey supers. It's a big old space for all the other bugs to take over. Good question. Oh, let me check my time here. Ooh, wow, where does the time go? Hey, Homer, how are you? Have you seen dead bees stranded behind a mouse guard be a serious issue? Ah. Uh, you know what? I, 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 it doesn't really matter if I've seen it or not. I'm just trying to process whether that would be a serious issue or not. I kind of think it, it can be. Yes. Um, I think I'm sure I've seen it. Remember, I've been keeping bees almost 30 years, I think. So I think there's been times where I've failed to scrape out the dying winter bees uh, during the middle of the winter. And I, I caused all the bees not to be able to get out through all the dying bees that plugged up the hole the entrance. So I think that can be a problem. I use winter bee kinds so they have an enter uh, upper entrance on it. So I never worry about that anymore. So we have bees dying naturally where I live here is so cold. They can't take them outside the hive for sometimes a whole month. And you're going to lose a lot of bees of natural dying in the winter. So you could have literally inches of dead bees down below blocking that bottom. And so that's why the, the top entrance is, the winner for me, the W-I-N-N-E-R. It's the winner. Um, unless you go out there and take one of the blue uh, scrapers. I think we still sell those blue scrapers. You can scrape the dead bees out. Um, so you're going to have to remove the mouse guard, aren't you, to, to be able to pull out uh, a, a way for your bees not to be blocked by all the dead sisters. That's good. Good question. I, I appreciate that. Oh, we got a donation tonight. Is that our first donation for the evening? Wow, we're almost done. We've made $20. That's great. I appreciate that. Sure. No, they're saying no, there's more donations, I think. So sorry, I didn't I didn't see them. Where was I at? Thank you for all your donations. I must have missed them. Okay. Well, well, thank you, Catherine. Appreciate that. All right. Uh hey, it's good to see Bruce's bees on here. Uh I always like to watch his videos. Uh Bruce is a fine fellow from the stream team, so that's cool. All right. Hey, we need to give away another tumbler before the time gets away from us. So let's uh, go ahead and um, think about that. Let me get that set up for us here. All right. So this tumbler, you guys can enjoy this. Uh, this will be our second tumbler giving it away for the evening. I'm going to change the name to drink, D R I N K, hashtag drink. Let me check it. Okay. Got it going there. So Hashtag drink will be the name that you can win. Yeah, make sure you, you use lowercase, by the way, not uppercase. So lowercase. Hashtag drink, and you can win one of our Beak Squad tumblers. I appreciate you guys participating in this. Bobby was our winner last time. Real nice tumbler to have as well. So we'll uh, be taking some of your... Uh, comments leave it in the comments right now again if you're watching the replay of this live stream don't bother to leave a comment because somebody already won but if you're watching it live now's the time hashtag drink um i like this area that i make my videos in right here this is a nice little studio for me to be in it's uh adjacent to our home not i have to walk out in the rain to get here but um this has really been a good uh, studio i've got a a back here that I, I can easily set down and make another video quickly. I've got another uh, back over there that has the Life is Sweet. You've probably seen some of those. Over in that corner, I have that screen where I write backwards on, and I have to really practice all winter long how to write backwards so that I can get that out <laughs> and start writing back, backwards again. All right. Wow, we got a lot of comments already. I think it says 122 with my blind eyes. So thank you, guys. Hashtag drink. And try to win a Tumblr, Beak Squad Tumblr. All right. I think we have these available as well, don't we, Sherry, on the website if they want to buy these? Oh, she's not listening to me. <laughs> Maybe it is. Yeah, there's a link. So, yeah, she says these are available on our, on a, if you don't win it, you can buy one. So let's take a look. Let's go ahead and uh, see. We have 132 people that are hoping to win this. 134. Let me give you uh, just one more second. Come on, hurry, get in there. We're going to draw it. All right, here we go. Ready? Here we go. Look at the names going by. I love doing this. I love giving things away. That's so fun. 
Who's going to win tonight? Todd, look at you. Way to go, Todd. All right. Email Sherry at longlanehoneybees at gmail.com and send your address where we can ship this nice uh, tumbler to you. And if you did not win, you can always get one from our website. Thank you guys for participating in that. All right. We got about, uh, about five or six minutes to continue to take some more questions for you guys uh, about beekeeping tonight. So uh, we have to give... Sh when I, when I have a giveaway, it destroys the comment section for Jessica and Sherry. They can't find your questions after that because the whole comments, all they see is hashtag drink. <laughs> they have to go to work really hard after that. All right, we got Linda. Hi, Linda. Uh, Linda's a big fan of my YouTube channel. I see her comments a lot. So, Linda, thank you for watching. Uh, I appreciate it. What are your thoughts on seeing hive beetles on the screen bottom boards? I have beetle traps in the hives. Beetles seem to have exploded this fall. Yeah, me too. Uh, beetles go right through that screen bottom board if it's the uh, one eighth hardware cloth on the screen bottom board. So they'll just go right through that. Um, if you have a solid bottom board, um, they can uh, be hanging out down there. I've found small hive beetles to hang out on hotter days down on the bottom board. And a friend of mine told me that what he does is he puts, you know, like a, like, let's say you have a B smart bottom board that has the corrugated plastic that slides in there, right? You no, I say, I want to say it correctly. What he said he does is that he actually will pull, he'll actually start up his yellow um, gas what am I trying? I can't think of the word. I, I have one here. There's a torch, the yellow torch that you, uh, you know, you sweat uh, copper joints with. But he lights that up, has an auto lighter built into it. Get him at Menards, Lowe's, any home store. He has that going. He'll slide that plastic out. And all at once, he'll just, he'll torch all those small hay beetles, burn them on that bottom board. <laughs> I think that's a great idea. I've never done that. And uh, he said you can do it on a top cover, but the bees are up there too. So there's collateral damage when you do that too. So um, thank you guys for leaving your uh, super stickers and things. I see those coming in. I really do appreciate that. Um, but uh, yeah, I think small hive beetles were a lot worse here uh, on my property this year too. I had to, I felt like I lived in the South um, again. I mean, it felt like I was like living in Georgia or someplace Florida with all the small hive beetles. Small hive beetles really are something to to deal with. Hey, Bruce, good to see you. Can you address feeding bees in the cold when they are late and need weight? Oh, Bruce. Yeah. Now, Bruce, you live <laughs> in Alabama where you guys, you know, your winter is this long and my winter is like, <laughs> but uh, so I can only tell you my experience, Bruce, but I have found that what I can do to really, um, you know, if you want to increase the weight of your hive, the best thing to do is feed them two to one in the fall because they can more quickly dry that down. And I'm sure you know this, but i um, telling it for everyone listening, but it, it, it will quickly be dried down because it's more thicker. And so that will add more feed that they can go through winter with. However, if I do that a lot up north, and I've had this happen to me a lot, they don't always get a chance to dry it down and they'll, they'll put it in the hive and it will actually crystallize and it will look like a disease. I've had so many people um, actually show me frames of crystallized pieces of uh, grains of sugar in comb. And so that is something you need to get ahead of before it does turn cold. So I think in Alabama, you don't have to worry about that. But in Illinois, you know, we can be feeding our bees one day at 50 degrees and that night it can drop down single digits and turn whatever they stored outside of their cluster into crystallized sugar. So that's kind of the issue if they don't dry it down good enough first. Um, so I don't practice that. I practice feeding my bees one-to-one -one all fall to raise bees of winter physiology. That triggers my queen and the nurse bees to feed what she lays with one-to-one -one sugar water. I think I even heard Bob Beanie say he goes lighter than one-to-one -one sometimes for bees of winter physiology. So I was kind of glad to hear him say that because not a lot of people practice raising bees of winter physiology by feeding them a thin syrup in the fall. But I've always done that and I teach that. 
And then in the winter time for storage, I put candy, my candy boards on top. So my candy boards are, is what my bees are going to be eating. Oh, yeah. All right, Dan, let's see if I got time. Yeah, I got time to get a few more questions in. Dan, uh, thanks for your donation, by the way, Dan. I appreciate that. Uh, anything you guys uh, donate helps me so much. It really does. Uh, can you destroy wax moths by placing a frame of drawn comb into a freezer? If so, can I safely store that frame in a plastic bag or plastic box for later use? Very good question. If you have wax moths and you store that frame um, or all the frames in a freezer, it will kill all stages of the wax moth. That's the best way to do it. Paradichlorine benzenate, um, that's, and, and then, you know, that's kind of a, um, it's a little carcinogenic. It's a little bit dangerous. PBC, PCB, it's a little bit risky. I don't like to use chemicals, um, but, but freezing always kills. It really does. It will kill the eggs and it will kill the larvae, kill the adult wax moths. So absolutely. In fact, here's what I always suggest. If you can't harvest that big eight or 10 frame of uh, honey super right away, if you can't harvest it and extract it, you know, put it in bottles, right? You can't get it out of the comb right away. You better freeze that whole super. Absolutely. That's what I do. I've got some, I got, <laughs> I've got many honey supers in my freezer because I ran out of time to harvest them. And so they're in there freezing and it has killed all the small high beetle eggs, all the small high beetle larvae that might be in that super. It killed all the wax moths and everything. And so now I don't have to worry about it. When I take it out, it's as good as when I put it in there. No difference in taste, quality, anything. It's as good. Now you have to have a big freezer to do that. And I think Sherry's uh, wanting some of her freezer space back. <laughs> she told me the other day, she's like, are you going to, you know, I was like, oh, I need to buy my own freezer, I guess. Yeah. Thank you, Bruce. I appreciate your donation tonight. Appreciate that. And Tommy, thank you as well. Appreciate it. So, yeah, um, I really think I've, I've, I think I've said this before. Uh, a smoker is the beekeeper's best friend. But sometimes I, uh, sometimes I'd say drawn comb is a beekeeper's best friend. A wax melter is a beekeeper's best friend, hive tool. But really, a, a big freezer, it really is a beekeeper's best friend. It gives you a lot of options to deal with honey frames that you can't harvest because I think I made a video. Yeah, I made a video last summer. I left a frame out that had uh, some eggs on it from small hay beetle. Those eggs hatched and tore that super up uh, sitting in one of my rooms. So I should have frozen. I had the space to freeze it. Good question. <clears throat> All right, good. Well, let me see. Uh, let's take one more question, Jessica or Sherry. I'll take one more. Got a minute or two left here for Beak Squad. Jimmy's Neighborhood Bees. What would you do if you had to leave your hive for three weeks in the month of April? Ooh, I'd pay somebody to sit there and get ready to catch a swarm. <laughs> I mean, um, that's what's going to happen. And where I live, that's what would happen in April. Uh, my bees are going to swarm, certainly in April and May. Um, I think I would do all the things I could to make sure they weren't in a swarming position. And that might mean making that split before I'm gone for three weeks, okay? So if you can reduce, uh, take out the, the mama queen with four or five frames, take her away in a nuke somewhere, and then they, the hive that potentially could have swarmed, they don't have a queen, so they're not going to swarm <laughs> until you get back. They won't swarm for a while anyway because they have to raise a queen to swarm. So that would be one way to deal with it. Go ahead and make a split before you leave. Yeah, good question. Well, guys, I'm going to say thank you so much. There's the list of all of you that uh, were so kind tonight to donate to our live stream. It does help. Um, it is extraordinarily expensive where I live to have high speed internet. So I like doing these live streams for you guys. And, uh, but I want to make sure that I can flip the bill. So your, your donations really do help a lot. So they do not go unnoticed or unappreciated. So I do appreciate it. it means a lot to me, but just those of you that I know some of you don't want to donate, donate or can't, or maybe you're watching on TV, a little more difficult. It's fine. You know, Hey, it's, I'm glad you're here watching whether you're donate or not, I'm, I just like you to be here and participate. So thank you for being here. Um, appreciate it a lot. If you, uh, 
want to be sure and check out our website at honeybeesonline.com. We do have online courses and we do have um, some of our feeders uh, available. I think we even have some winter bee kinds without the sugar in them. Uh, they kind of come and go, but some of those are available if you're still interested in those for the year. And so we do appreciate you supporting. So let me say this. I love you guys a lot. I appreciate it. I wish we could have just spent the evening live, like side by side. I wish all of you could have been in this room together because I really do like seeing you and being with you. But we're going to have a lot of opportunities to do that <clears throat> in about a month at uh, North American Honey Bee Expo. So be sure and check that out. I'd like to see a lot of you there January the 4th through the 6th. I think tickets are still for sale. I really do. And if you can be there, it'd be fun. You're going to have to introduce yourself. Remember, you know me because you see me a lot, but I've never seen your face. Some of you I've never seen. So you're going to have to tell me. <laughs> Don't assume I know you. Tell me who you are, okay? I want to thank Jessica and Sherry again. They did an outstanding job tonight of keeping things going, keeping me on track tonight. But mostly thank all of you for being here. And uh, we're going to sign off for the evening and wish all of you happy holidays. And we'll be back with you next Thursday. But be looking for all the video content that I'll continue to make for you guys. A lot of it coming out. A lot of it's going to be helpful for you. All, all winter long, I'll be making content for you. So good night. We'll see you next time.